Thanks, John. Um, in Denmark, around 85% of ambulance services and 60% of fire services are delivered by a private for-profit provider, as they have been since the 1920s, uh, when a socialist government uh, allowed local councils to contract with external providers. Unlike its public sector counterparts in Denmark and pretty much anywhere else in the world, Falk Rednick's Corp offers an integrated rescue capability that brings together fire, uh, flood and marine salvage, subscription and emergency services, animal rescue as well as human rescue. The company's slogan, Erde Altid, always there, captures rather neatly this vision of an integrated service. In addition to the traditional emergency services, which are provided, of course, free of charge, Falk offers a wide range of subscription services, patient transportation, a salvage core, including ocean salvage, auto assistance at home and abroad, animal rescue, trauma counselling, chiropractic treatment, and managed care of chronic diseases through telemedicine. They have agreements with the police to tow illegally parked cars, provide drive divers for searches and remove bodies from crime scenes. The Animal Protection Foundation contracted with them to transport sick and injured animals. As the Chief Executive explained to me um, when I visited him at Urhus some uh, years ago, he said, we've acquired this role. If you need help, call Falk, irrespective of the problem you might have. No one else provides such a broad service. If you were to contact your, no your local municipality, you wouldn't know which department to call. But if you needed help, you only needed to call Falk. If a horse fell in a ditch, it was always Falk. If a storm the storm removed the roof from your house or you needed to pump water from your basement, you phoned Falk. This cartoon was published in Denmark uh, some years ago and neatly captures this idea of an integrated rescue service. As you'll see, Falk's everywhere, rescuing portly gentlemen who've fallen into uh, fountains, recovering hats, and in the corner over there, at that street corner, uh, providing screens to um, provide some pr privacy for couples who were canoodling uh, in the street. Among the Danes, Falk is a public service. In local directories, the company is listed after the emergency services number 112 and ahead of the police. At, at Legoland, where this is uh, from, the fire engines bear Falk's name and logo. Um, I first became aware of Falk in 1995 when the ABC interviewed an English academic, Norman Flynn, about the denationalisation of public services in Europe. And Fl Flynn was clearly uncomfortable with the whole idea of privatisation and outsourcing, but he struggled to categorise Falk, and I'm quoting. He said, Falk's an anomaly in Europe. Uh, it's a complete aberration. Everyone trusts Falk like they trust the state. It's a quasi-state thing. Um, it just happens to be privately owned. But it is a natural monop national monopoly for these emergency services. But it's interesting because the Danes trust Falk as they trust the state, end of quote. To a much greater extent than those of us in the English-speaking world recognise, the social democratic countries of Western Europe rely on a mixed economy for the delivery of their public services. I was reminded of this last month while facilitating a seminar on behalf of the Forum of Federations in Melbourne. And there'd been a series of front page articles in the Melbourne Press about some scandal in the state's hospitals. And a British um, academic, Clive Grace, held up this one of the front pages uh, and observed that it could just as easily have been uh, the headline of a paper in the UK. Um, now, I found it impossible to find any of those headlines, which probably tells you that it was one of those passing crises um, that the media managed to discover and move quickly on from. But anyway, here's a sort of a random list of uh, head newspaper headlines about crises in, in Australian public hospitals. The speaker after Clive was a German academic named Wolfgang Rentsch from University of Magdeburg, and he commented that such an issue wouldn't make a headline in Germany because, he said, with the exception of some veterans' facilities, German hospitals are owned and managed by private, uh, not-for-profit and municipal providers. Um, in Germany, the management of hospital services is not the responsibility of state and national governments, and therefore politicians would not be caught up in that same way. In looking at public services in the social democratic countries of Northwest Europe from here, we overlook the extent to which they are mixed economies. In part, this is because the Europeans don't draw the same crisp distinctions between public and private that we do in the English-speaking world. And the privatisation debate, as a result, resonates in a different way than it has uh, in our, our uh, uh, part of the world. My proposition is that we would have a better chance of pursuing innovative new approaches to public service delivery if we were to bridge the deep and largely ideological gulf 
uh, that we have constructed between public and private. And that if we were to reframe the debate um, to move uh, beyond um, public and private, simple concepts of public and private, we might be able to take this um, discussion about new models and new approaches in an age of austerity further. In fact, over the past decade, there has been a discernible softening of this strict divide, particularly in, in the UK and Australia. On both sides of the political fence, governments have increasingly turned to external providers for the delivery of public services, and we've begun to see the emergence of public-private hybrids that defy simple classification. Now, in truth, the boundaries um, between public and private were never as severe as the ideologues would have us believe. Um, there was certainly a preference for large industrial institutions over the first half of the 20th century, but the public service sector was never, uh, was always a mixed economy with hybrids that didn't easily fit in, in, in any camp. Private and not-for-profit schools have always been part of the education sectors, um, the education sector in Australia. And the debate over state aid that has raged since the 1960s is not about whether or not we will prescribe uh, proscribe non-government schooling, but whether taxpayers will subsidise them with partial vouchers. Uh, in, the, in Canada and the UK, uh, interestingly, they dealt with that problem somewhat differently, and the equivalent of, I suppose, the Catholic systemic schools here um, would, w were classed as public schools. They sort of were categorised under a heading of public. Um, Britain had grant-aided and grant-maintained schools from as early as 1902. Much the same applied when it came to the health sector. In, the, in New South Wales, uh, we have a number of privately owned and operated public hospitals, um, known as, um, in the relevant part of the Act, as affiliated health organisations or um, Schedule Three hospitals. And they've been there since the early part of the 20th century. Um, the most prominent of those is an iconic Sydney uh, institution, St Vincent's um, Hospital in Darlinghurst, which is, as I say, an iconic part of the public hospital system, but in fact um, is a not-for-profit uh, um, private hospital operating as a public hospital has done for almost a century. The vast majority of what we now call community services uh, were conceived and created and to this day are still operated by the not-for-profit sector and commented on that this morning. Um, I grew up in a little small country town in southeast Queensland and I can remember watching the blue nurses, car, the, the cars from the blue nurses come and go in the street while we played cricket in the front yard. It was just sort of one of those service, community services, one of those public services that was there as a presence in the background uh, as one grew up. The voluntary sector has, was always the great innovator when it came to the development of new public services. Indeed, uh, it is difficult to think of a public service um, apart from those that require some element of coercion, which was not invented by the, uh, by the voluntary sector. Hospitals, schools, fire brigades, ambulance, ambulances, ocean rescue, professionally designed and maintained highways, um, believe it or not, social insurance, home care for the sick and disabled, the concept of probation, a probation service. And I've often challenged audiences to name a non-coercive public service that was invented by government. And over three or four years of putting that challenge to, to, to my audience, and we've got a large group here, so I won't get you to do it now, no one's been able to identify one. Somebody once suggested that urban planning um, uh, was, and now in one sense urban planning is a regulatory role, but the idea of a well-planned um, city might be regarded as a public service. But in fact, the Garden City was conceived by a private individual, Ebenezer Howard, and the first garden cities in England, Letchworth and Welland, were constructed by not-for-profit corporations, which he created. And indeed, England has a history of privately developed towns that goes back to the Middle Ages. In the UK, uh, someone suggested the National Health Service. Um, now, in part, what was unique about the NHS was, was that it was universal and thus more equitable, and that implies access to the taxation system, um, and, of course, that implies access to the coercive powers of the state. So, you know... Charities don't, and private companies don't do equity. Government does equity. But the principles of integrated health care, which was supposed to be one of the unique offerings of the National Health Service, was drawn from the Great Western Railway Medical Fund, which was established by the GWR at Swindon in 1847, um, a very innovative model which um, f influenced the early design of the NHS a century later. The Australian um, public service sector is and always has been a mixed economy with a diverse range of public, private and not-for-profit providers. On my rough 
calculations, somewhere around one third of public services in this country today are provided by independent providers. Uh, in some community services, um, it's as high as 90 to 95%. In health and education, it's around one in three. Um, uh, in prisons, it averages one in five prisoners who are managed in a privately managed prison. In some other public services, such as policing, of course, the, uh, the role of external providers is negligible. And there is bipartisan agreement in this country that uh, on the desirability of having a mixed economy. I don't hear anyone suggesting that, 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 sort of, that those sort of ratios should be wound back. Um, and indeed, uh, in the last few years, we've seen Labor governments, uh, as well as coalition governments, substantially expand the role of private and not-for-profit provision. So in arguing that in their search for solutions to the austerity challenge, Australian government should move beyond simple notions of public and private, I maintain that they need to look at the full range of public service providers, not merely those that are contr directly controlled by public officials. Among those 30% of public services that are provided by private and not-for-profit organisations, there are monopolies that need to be opened up to contestability. There are services that are delivered under programs that are decades out of date and are in urgent need of being recommissioned. If we reframe the debate so that we're scrutinising the performance of and drawing upon the capabilities of the full range of public service providers, then we substantially expand the scope for reform. So, the mixed economy. Now, let me suggest another way in which we can reframe the debate about reform. Many of those who advocate privatisation or outsourcing as a means of transforming public services base their argument on an assumption that the private and not-for-profit sectors are inherently superior to the public sector, private good, public bad. With limited exceptions, that proposition isn't borne out by the evidence, and it's offensive to the hundreds of thousands of men and women who have dedicated themselves to a career in public service. The evidence suggests that it is contestability uh, rather than privatisation that delivers the benefits. Um, and while the concept of contestability is deeply challenging to policymakers and those engaged in frontline delivery, and while there are some public services where an uncontested government monopoly is unavoidable and indeed desirable, there is nothing inherently offensive in the slogan, competition good, monopoly bad. Where the public at large is generally sceptical about privatisation or outsourcing of public services, they have little sympathy with monopolists in the public or the private sector. The public likes the idea of user choice, just witness the overnight popularity of the NDIS. And they warm to the idea of competitive tendering as long as they can be reassured that the tender is conducted openly and fairly. One of the significant breakthroughs over the past decade in thinking about public service reform has been the discovery of contestability. Contestability is not just outsourcing and it is, does not necessarily involve competition. It is the credible threat of competition. Um, or benchmarking with teeth. Where there is already a monopoly in the private sector, then simple outsourcing will result in a less contestable outcome than robust benchmarking or other innovative models that involve public sector provision. Contracts for a longer term than is necessary, than is justified by the nature of the contract, uh, limits contestability. Traditional outsourcing is often inappropriate where public services are inherently monopolistic where the services in question are unique or so closely integrated that they can't be broken down into parts or where there is a problem with physical or human asset specificity. To my knowledge, the first person to explore the concept of um, the application of contestability to public services was Chris Hamm, then Professor of Health Policy and Management at the University of Birmingham, uh, who published a brief note in the British Medical Journal in 1996. Chris was in sort of the ANZOG tradition, uh, was seconded to the Department of Health from 2000 to 2004 and served as director of the strategy unit there. And he's now chief executive of the King's Fund, which is probably the UK's most influential think tank in the health sector. But in 1996, following the collapse of the first experiment with the NHS internal market, Chris wrote, while competition as a reforming strategy may have had its day, there are nevertheless elements of this strategy that are worth pursu pursuing, preserving not least the stimulus to improve performance which arises from the threat that contracts may be moved to an alternative provider should not be lost. The middle way between planning and competition is a path called contestability. This recognises that healthcare requires cooperation between purchasers and providers and the capacity to plan developments for the, on a long-term basis. At the same time, 
It's based on the premise that the performance may stagnate unless there are sufficient incentives to bring about continuous improvement. Some of these incentives may be achieved through management action or professional pressure, and some may derive from political imperatives. In addition, there is the stimulus to improve performance which exists when providers know that purchasers have alternative options. The essence of contestability is that planning and competition should be used together, with contracts moving only when other means of improving performance have failed. Put another way, in a contestable health service, it is the possibility that contracts may move that creates an incentive within the system rather than the actual movement of contracts. Now, of course, for this to be a real incentive, he said, contracts must shift from time to time, end of quote. In some situations, outsourcing is still the most appropriate course of action. There is now a well-developed market in this country for warehousing and logistics. And the onus of proof now must rest on those who would argue that warehousing and logistics should be done in-house. Um, so this is the so-called yellow pages test, um, which governor, the governor of California, Pete Wilson, in 1996, described that, that as, if a service provided by government is advertised by private companies in the yellow pages, it's a good candidate for privatisation. The Americans tend to use the term privatisation here rather than contracting or outsourcing. So what he's saying is if you can find somebody that's in the yellow pages that's doing this, you really ought to be asking the question why you're doing it in-house. In some cases, the technological capabilities of private sector firms have outstripped those of the public sector. Um, and in those cases, governments may decide outsourcing is the most suitable course. The innovative new road maintenance contracts being tendered by the New South Wales Road and Maritime Services, which I wrote about last week in the Financial Review, are an example of this. Each of the shortlisted consortia um, has one or more international companies involved in their bid because the RMS is drawing heavily on models that have been developed in New Zealand and the UK. The New, New South Wales government has elected not to develop those capabilities in-house or to form joint ventures with international corporations, and you know, I can understand why they might have made that decision. And there are also situations where, in order to create a credible threat of competition for the rest of the systems, governments may elect to outsource a proportion of public services. The New South Wales Labor government did not permit an in-house bid when it conducted a competitive tender for the management of Park Lee Prison in 2009. Outsourcing was used for the explicit purpose of making credible the threat of competition across the system as a whole. Throughout the rest of its term in office, however, Labor employed a policy of contestability in the reform of its prisons. Contestability drives robust benchmarking and it motivates public service managers to undertake serious reform. It recognises that private sector monopolies are no better than public sector monopolies and in many cases worse. It's a good example of an approach to public service reform that goes beyond the traditional debate of public versus private. I could have structured these to go through more smoothly, but anyway. Now, as some of you are aware, and it was mentioned, I spent 10 years in the UK running a, a corporate think tank for a large public service company. And the first research project we undertook after I took over the management of that institution was to interview contract managers who used to manage the same service in the public sector. So same people doing the same job in a different model. And um, it was a, a hugely uh, insightful piece of work. And it turned out that many of the benefits of competitive tendering come not from competition, but from contracting. Competition is by no means unimportant. Um, the process of winning a competitive tender bestows on management a powerful mandate for reform, which enables them to renegotiate custom and practice. So it can be um, an important tool. But a great deal of work is done by the contract itself. A performance contract provides much greater clarity for frontline managers about government's priorities. When they are written into a contract, performance targets provide predictability so that management and staff know how they'll be judged and they're able to adapt their behaviour accordingly. A term contract provides frontline managers with stability so that, say, for a period of five or seven years, they're isolated to some extent from the policy churn that has become a feature of modern politics. It's unsurprising, then, that contract managers who used to work in the public sector reported that the contractual shield provided them with a great deal more autonomy and authority in managing their teams, but they also reported feeling personally much more accountable 
Since the boundaries of the organisation were more clearly defined and since performance targets were more predictable and stable, they knew that they would not be able to shift responsibility to someone else. Service level agreements between public service commissioners and um, the commissioners of public services and public sector agencies have made little impact because they have failed to comprehend the essence of what makes um, a contract work. Again, if we reframe the question so that we focus on the contract rather than just competition or contestability, we might open up a whole new range of tools that we might employ in addressing the challenge of austerity. The concept of diversity offers us another way of doing this. <clears throat> and some of the, the examples and themes that I'm about to refer to have been woven into the fabric of this conference. Traditionally, public service commissioners have drawn on a very limited range of tools in the design of solutions to policy problems. That has begun to change, but there's still not enough tools in the policymakers toolkit. The great American psychologist Abraham Maslow once observed that if the only tool you've got is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. Uh, and we often sort of know that, but when you realise it was Maslow who said it, it's, you sort of pause and just think on that just a little bit longer. Uh, my wife and I are in the process of renovating a house we've just purchased, um, and we find that we're greatly reassured when the tradie uh, who turns up is obviously drawing on a diverse range of experience, employing a wide range of tools, some of which they've developed themselves over years in the business. What makes the craftsman is not the tool, but the toolbox. Our capacity to understand the problem in front of us is constrained by the range of possible solutions at our command. If the only tools you've got available to you are a hammer and a monkey wrench, then if someone sticks a watch in front of you and asks you what's the problem and can you fix it, you're going to be struggling because you've got two tools that, uh, that are not particularly appropriate for the task at hand. Privatisation and outsourcing have certainly introduced diversity into the range of models on which policymakers can draw, but not very much. And there are many public services where privatisation and outsourcing would be decidedly inappropriate. Much the same applies to so-called digital government, can I say. It's a useful addition to the toolkit, but it's only one instrument in a range of alternatives that we should be exploring. Now, over the past few years, we've seen the emergence of new models that are not easily slotted into the old categories of public, private and not-for-profit. Um, you've had a session this morning, some people have attended, on social impact bonds. Uh, while we've not really moved beyond the pilot phase, even in the UK, um, and certainly not in um, the United States or here in New South Wales, where our second pilot in New South Wales has just kicked off, well, is in the process of kicking off, um, there is significant interest in this radical new approach. What's interesting given the subject of what I'm talking about today, is that in the UK, some of the providers in these consortia of these social impact bonds are public entities, local governments and the like. We're also seeking public-private hybrids that provide scope for contestability where traditional outsourcing would not. In the UK, one of the most interesting is GST, GSTS pathology, a public-private joint venture between two leading NHS hospital trusts and a large public service company. The NHS trusts bring to the joint venture their expertise in pathology, while the private company brings its expertise in management. NHS staff are seconded rather than transferred so that the trusts have retained their negotiating power within the joint venture. This is a grown up, very commercial joint venture. This is not so soft and woolly. Now we've seen the emergence of some hybrids here in Australia. Um, I've referred in some published work to the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse, a new oncology facility at the RPA in Sydney. Uh, in fact, I think it's got some really serious design flaws that um, have now delayed uh, signing a formal agreement between public and private for some time. I think it's perhaps is going to turn out to be a monstrous hybrid. But nevertheless, we're seeing similar kind of experimentation occurring here. In the UK's welfare to work and rehabilitation sectors, the probation sectors, we've seen the emergence of a new service model generally referred to by public officials as the integrator model. This particular one was Circo, G4S have done it as well. Um, and in this particular case, the company assumes significant financial and operational risk for delivering service outcomes, but the integrators deliver none of the actual services themselves. They, rather, they assemble and they then manage fairly closely a diverse supply chain on behalf of government. 
Um, so that there's a really interesting argument that the, that the, the sort of d darker coloured band at the top there, the integrator, is acting as a government's agent managing the supply chain rather than, than represent, you know, being a, the head of a virtual organisation selling, selling up into government. Um, we spoke again, we had a session this morning on public service mutuals, um, uh, which was, I thought, a terrific session. Um, there's widespread criticism of public service mutuals in the UK. Um, private corporations sort of dismiss them as nostalgia for the cooperative movement of the 19th, 19th century. Union leaders, including some here in Australia, insist they're just another form of privatisation. In fact, employee-owned enterprises are relatively common in the professional services sectors. Lawyers, accountants, consultants, healthcare professionals usually operate under a partnership model which is essentially employee-owned. Employee there are structural features that explain why employee ownership is, co is, is common in professional services. And in my view, those features occur in many parts of the public service economy. Other than a lack of imagination, I find it difficult to understand why public service mutuals could not succeed as an alternative um, business model. Some of the greatest innovation um, is taking place in India, where social entrepreneurs are developing profoundly different models of public service delivery in circumstances where governments um, because of um, uh, inadequate tax revenues, cannot hope to meet the needs of a population uh, demanding um, health uh, education services and the like. And in fact, the term frugal innovation comes out of um, this, these, these, these social entrepreneurs who are developing these new models in India. Um, examples include high volume, high quality heart surgery being performed at a fraction of the cost of comparable services in the West. In large part, this is possible because these industries are lightly regulated in India. Um, the professional guilds do not have the same capacity to prevent experimentation with innovative new approaches. And while public service providers in the West probably won't want to directly adopt those models, I think it's highly likely that they will be deeply influenced by the lessons that have been learned um, out of the, uh, the frugal innovation period in, in, uh, in India. In the exploration of alternative service models, it's vital that government ensures that there is appropriate transparency and accountability. Issues of competitive neutrality inevitably arise, but these issues, as Paul Maltby indicated um, before lunch in our session, are by no means insuperable. I was intimately involved in the development of the competitive neutrality principles in this country. They were developed when we were designing a framework for the corporatization of government business enterprises in the late 1980s. And contrary to what some analysts now maintain, I discover, um, uh, corporatisation wasn't developed as a staging post on the road to privatisation, but as a means of enabling government business enterprises to behave in a more commercial way and to compete fairly in the wider economy. Corporatisation was intended as a reform which carried the debate beyond public and private, and a succession of reports by the Productivity Commission and the New South Wales Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal are witness to the massive productivity gains that came from that process. Looking at the recent debate over the state of the Commonwealth budget, there is little doubt that Australian governments are in for a period of sustained austerity. While there may be some scope for further tax increases, it's going to be limited, and both state and federal governments must look to the effectiveness with which they deliver public services. The fiscal gap is now so large that it cannot be closed just through staff freezes, efficiency dividends, and waste watch committees. In looking at the range of plausible reform tools, um, I've been deeply influenced by Aaron Waldavsky's assessment of zero-based budgeting in the US government in the 1960s. He was actually quoting a public servant he interviewed. He said, some butterflies were caught, no elephants stopped. Governments have to start looking for the elephant stoppers. And done well, contracting, contestability, uh, offer that potential. But governments must also look for solutions that are capable of commanding bipartisan support. They must find a framework that unleashes the energy of the change vanguard. They must create a narrative that will generate a broadly based reform coalition within government well beyond that vanguard. And having got the flywheel spinning, this is a metaphor from Steve's, Steve's book, having got sort of the effort to get the flywheel spinning, they must find a way of maintaining the momentum of, of reform over time through successive changes of government. It must outlast any, uh, any electoral cycle. There are a variety of ways in which this might be done, but none of them will be possible, in my view, if we do not find a way of moving beyond traditional uh, concepts of public and private. 